Graham Plowman, the world's greatest composer. How are you? <laughs> uh, I, well, you have me at a disadvantage. Or I have you at a disadvantage. I can see you. Oh, I can't see you. Where are you? No, I don't have any uh, camera thing. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking to Graham Plowman, the world's greatest composer, the Irish-born, self-taught uh, musical genius. Uh, welcome to the show, Graham. How are you? That's some introduction. I've never uh, been called that before. Thank you very much. I'm good. Good. Well, it's How nice to finally uh, speak to you. We've been flirting on Facebook for about a year now. How do you find the time to make models work a job, uh, do all this music, <laughs> raise a family and all that stuff? Where's the, where's the time come from? Um... I, I, yeah, I just stay up too late. <laughs> how many, how many too years? Late have, the middle of the night, you know. How many years have you you've been doing music now? From like from today. I mean, if we go back in um, time, when did you actually begin composing and writing music? Well, it's kind of a mixed bag. Like, so if you go right back, okay. So I was just messing around uh, with piano and uh, just not not really composing, not trying to do anything seriously uh, for you know over. 25 years probably just on and off playing the piano here and there writing a few little pieces and usually it was sort of classical related and you know I wasn't trying to do anything serious with it then then I saw a short fan film called The Hunt for Gollum that was released in 2009 yeah and I, I kind of said to myself you know I'd love to be doing music for like stuff like that you know like little projects and short films and whatever else never did like imagine that you know I'd be doing feature film or anything like that you know yeah. so I said to myself you know as a big fan of Lord of the Rings you know I'll, I'll investigate what I need to to actually try and write some orchestral music uh, on the computer yeah, and, and all that stuff so, so I got a decent computer started buying a couple of uh, cheaper libraries used them they didn't sound great, but I used them as a learning tool to kind of learn how to orchestrate stuff. Sure. I kept going. Still learning. Orchestration is such a tough gig. Um, and so, <clears throat> excuse me, that was in 2009. Then around 2010, I kind of started releasing a few little pieces. And it was slowly but surely, I started making a little bit of money so I could buy better instrument libraries and then make better tracks, make slightly more money, and just I, I just kept feeding the money back in to actually keep purchasing sure. extra extra libraries to help the sound and make everything better. I think what a lot of people uh, don't understand as well is that most music, even for like enormous scale films like the Marvel movies and things, they're all all the orchestrations like Hans Zimmer and stuff. They all begin on a computer, don't they? Um, they a lot most of them do now yeah, yeah. and well ha with Hans Zimmer it probably always was uh, the likes of John Williams he'll always just use a pen and paper sure. uh, a pencil and paper that'll never change um, you know he's 84 now so you know or 83 going mm. 84 he's not going to change his ways now um, but yeah I mean essentially uh, the way the way it is now in, in the in the major Hollywood film industry is that you basically create a very detailed mock-up of what that final track is actually going to sound like. Yeah. And that before it actually goes to the real live recording session with the orchestra, because it gone are, are the days of you know surprise. This is what the music actually sounds like in the recording session. It's more these days the director needs to hear exactly what the what it sounds like. Um, and on low and most a huge amount of TV. Uh, and all sorts of films from independent films and, and general low budget films are using sample libraries mm. because recording orchestras is an incredibly expensive uh, affair. Yeah, it's. Uh, well, I was going to touch on that actually. Like uh, I mentioned in the kind of editorial I did about you, that uh, like John Williams, the late James Horner, uh, Howard Shaw, a lot of scoring now in films, even with the like the big stuff like the Marvel films, they don't really have that sweeping romantic hollywood kind of like adventure score feel and i think uh, your work particularly on arthur and merlin of course kind of harks back to that kind of john williamsy kind of like uh, corn gold kind of you know that feeling i mean how do you feel about that i mean i what are your influences as a, as a, a composer um well yeah definitely uh, like john williams i mean john williams uh in the 80s you know i mean that's what i grow up listening 
yeah. grew up listening to. You yeah, know, me too. Uh, E.T. and Star Wars and uh, Indiana Jones. Uh, and then there was, you know, Back to the Future, Alan Silvestri, Predator, and, uh, you know, his his scores. Sure. Uh, and then there was other films that used all that kind of stuff, like James Horner with Cruel, Willow. Uh, <laughs> um you know what I mean? It's, it's con- all, all of those kind of films that all had this sort of rich mm. symphony kind of orchestral but Hollywood, Hollywood kind of I suppose John Williams, John Williams ushered that in, in I guess, in a sense, because Spielberg used him on Jaws, and then he was like, you've got to use this guy for, uh, what is it, Star Wars, because he had that, he, Spielberg said yeah, he's got that he Corn Gold kind of... George Lucas. Yeah, yeah. The, I think Corn Gold did a score called The Seahawk, and you, if you listen to that, it's very uh, evocative of like uh, like Star Wars and all the kind of the stuff that John Williams like events like did basically yeah, brand. I mean, temp music is a big thing uh, where you know uh, with the editing the film or putting the film together, they'll use temp music. They'll take whatever music from from whatever it be and they'll stick it on and they'll probably cut the film to this temporary music. And I don't know how true it is, but there's reports that a lot of the temp music used on Star Wars was Congo. Yeah. Um, um, and well, uh, Mahler, the the planets like yeah. Mars and stuff, and there's a lot of similarities. I don't actually. It probably wasn't temp music. It might have been more of a Lucas saying to Williams, "Have a listen to this. That's kind of what I want." Yeah. Now, Star Wars was, you know, with the the way it, with the wipes and all that kind of stuff and mm. everything. You know, it, it was based on that kind of. It's that like Flash um, Gordon serials and stuff, isn't it? Yeah, but, yeah. it's serials. A bit like, you know, more so even, um, Indiana Jones and more so even based on that. But but the Star Wars had to, they wanted that romantic sound, the, mm. you know, that high strings that, that, you know, where they're killing themselves trying to get the vibrato out of the strings, making such a rich, deep kind of tone out of it, you know? Mm. And, and, and yeah, and so that ushered into the 80s, uh, this constant kind of sound that that was used but it, it started to go out of fashion fairly soon mm. and it became, became a case that john williams was probably the only one still maintaining uh, that and and williams's sound has grown up as well i mean he's he's the new star wars score is a more contemporized i was going to ask period. you about that because i i ordered it listened to it and i felt really cold sadly by the whole thing there was nothing kind of i think all the other star wars scores including I'll get shot for saying this, but the prequel scores, they actually the prequel had... prequel music is amazing. Yeah, you, you walk out of the theatre and it, it exists outside of the film itself. But this, I'm not sure if it's a factor of the man's age or anything, but it just seemed to be kind of lacking something, or maybe, I, I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah. Um, oh, there's a few skills of thought on that one. Uh, well, he, he works six hours a day now instead of, uh, you know, whatever, eight or 12 hours a day that yeah. he used to. You know, I mean, yes, he's older, but I think he had the time to do it. Some of it is probably, you know, director influence. Uh, I, I know what that can be like. Mm. Um, <laughs> no, 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 it, it's good. I mean, it's useful. It's, all, it's, it's always useful. It stops you doing something that the director just says, why did you do all that? I hate it. Uh, do something completely different. Well, I was going to say, go, you touching on the director hating something and talking about temp scores, uh, Jerry Goldsmith had a massive falling out with uh, Terry Rawlings, the editor of Alien and Ridley Scott, because they temp scored the entire film with his score for Freud, which is a yeah. f- film from the early 60s. And then by the time they got to finish the film and he delivered his like very apparently sweeping Star Trek style score, they didn't like it. And they kept all the Freud music in it for the most part. And he was he's still furious about that until the time of his death in 2004. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> how, how, what was it like when you how did, when you work on a film and you did Arthur and Merlin, for instance? How does that work? You get you you're given ideas of what the director wants, and then you deliver something, and he either scraps it or says this is good work with it, or you kind of yeah. We we went and had a, a spotting session. Myself and Marco sat down and watched the film. Now I have to say we probably should have done a more detailed spotting session than we did. Uh, I guess we were both sort of just under the gun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and kind of thinking general general feel as opposed to any any specifics you know and then when we started uh, when i started actually working on the score um i had some pieces that i'd written so i'd, I'd done a lot of sketches right mm. so i've done a lot of music sketches with different teams and just sort of made up pieces to 
changed every every minute it kind of changed to something else it wasn't really consistent pieces sure. but it wasn't meant to be either it was meant to be for this kind of part of the film this kind of idea might work and then a minute later i'll change to a different idea that'll work in a different part of the film is that like the journey to Wynar track the film. Hmm? journey to Wynar, that kind of tracks like that isn't it kind of like it changes a, a quite a lot and uh you know well that's yeah that's well that was that was that was uh, change specifically to to the cuts of the film, right? Yeah. Where the guys are chasing Arthur, and then that's one of the best the, bits, I think. Where you've got the bad guys kind of chasing the theme, and then you've got like the Ethereum uh, hero theme and stuff. Yeah, that so that hero team, the, the, that four, no, or eight bars of that hero team were written before the film, mm. right? And most of the music that I think stands out in the film was written before the film yeah so i what i've what i've discovered you know because okay i've only done one feature right and what i've discovered straight pretty much straight away after doing this one feature when you write away from the screen and this is what ennio morricone does ennio morricone says don't tell don't give me the, the film just tell me what the scene is about all right this guy's climbing up a hill blah 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 fine i'll go on write music so what happens is you end up writing music that that has form structure um a melody if you, if you wanted to, to have one um, and whatever else you, you end up writing a piece that makes sense right sure and if you can make that work on the film what you end up is you end up with some good music and it also suits the film so um that's pretty much what john williams does okay he can write the picture generally but he's not looking at the film going right put these notes here right go on five frames put these notes here whatever he's just writing a piece of music and he knows all the major beats of uh hans Solo shoots the gun at this part uh, uh whatever you know whatever it be the millennium falcon flies away at this at this part you yeah. know and he just writes music that is very very intricate and detailed uh with a lot of orchestration and when you watch star wars or or pretty much any of the films the music is doing all sorts of complex things, even under dialogue scenes. Mm. Go a bit of movement, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, just a lot of strings and melody and everything else, like all the Star Wars melodies, like the love themes and everything else. I mean, that Han Solo was talking to Leia about what sure Luke wasn't on the Death Star sure. when it blew up. And underneath uh, them talking is the complete Han and Leia uh, love team, yeah. right? Which has got lots of movement. Well, that's blah, established blah, blah. in the second one, isn't it? And then they kind of yeah, you, yeah. But it was in the third one, so Luke had just gotten away. They, they just destroyed the, the second uh, Death Star, and and that, that kind of style is gone now, right? So now you now you get uh, do not have any movement. Mm. My character is speaking on screen. That means you need to do almost nothing, mm. and uh, and that works too, right? That that works as well. But it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, that, that's, I think that's uh, what's happened to film music at the moment. Yeah, right? well, it's like there's a character missing from a film now. I mean, like I said, the Marvel films, they're all fantastic. And I guess they're the closest thing we've got to that 1980s Spielbergian yeah. action-adventure era again. But if you look at each film, most yeah. of the scores are done by different composers, even for the Avengers. I think Adam Silvestri did the first one, and I think Danny Elfman did the second one. And it's this clash of two um, styles, and I want you know. It's no, a... no, Brian Tyler did the second one, though he he used a couple of teams that Elfman had written. Okay. Uh, actually, no, nobody's completely sure what context mm. uh, was Elfman's involvement in that. Um, that's a bit of a mystery. Uh, maybe somebody knows. Yeah. I, I I don't know what it is, but Brian Tyler did most of that. Most of the the score for the second one, but he used Silvestri's. Uh, Avengers team. That one, yeah. That's yeah, the main and, and 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 there's like only it's only like four notes or something, and it's it's very um it's, it's very catchy, it's very well done. Like so, but 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 yeah, the the style of of film scoring is it, you know, the fashion of the old Hollywood kind of sound. Obviously, that's that's mm. that's gone now. You know, uh, it, even the Williams sound and all that stuff that that's pretty much gone. Is Hans, Hans Zimmer? Hans yeah, Zimmer. Yeah. Do you stuff. think he's to kind of blame for that? Because a lot of like composers have come out under his wings in a sense, like Harry Gregson Williams, Steve Jablonski, Mark Streitenfeld, who did who does all the Ridley Scott films now and stuff. Yeah. But they all seem to have this kind of like 
they're all lovely scores and things, but they're nothing you actually think. Oh, you don't hum it when you leave the th- cinema. You don't. It's, it's, yeah, but that, it's, yeah, that's exactly it. You don't. You don't remember the mm. team because there's prob- there probably isn't a team. It's more of an instrument choice or a feeling or a tone set by the music, mm. as opposed to memorable teams under underneath characters. Um, are they to blame for it? Well. Not necessarily. It's what directors want. You know, I mean, directors come and say, "I want to score like this." And everything is very Zimmer esque, though, isn't it? Now, and it that's what that, that was the point I was trying to make. Yeah, yeah. They're, I mean, the the sort of continuing ostinato sort of effect of the strings just going, you know, kind the dark night thing. Yeah, yeah, and they don't stop for like you know twenty minutes. Um. Yeah, it's. It's, yeah, it's just it's fashion. It's it's that's what the sound is these days. That's what people want. Mm. You know, um, I mean, John Powell uh, came from the Hans Zimmer as well. Well, he did the Bourne John films, didn't he, John Powell? Hmm? He did the Bourne movies. They're like really cool scores, but they are very Zimmer esque. Uh, jo- the John Powell stuff. Yeah, but yeah, but he also did How to Train Your Dragon. Mm. Um, he, he does a Kung lot Fu of the Panda. animation films. <laughs> What? He did Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And and they're they're very, uh, especially How to Train Your Dragon is very, um, very melodic and team based and, and and everything else, you know. So, it's, um, the what's the name of the guy who does the Transformers? Uh, Steve, Steve Jablonski. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, he's. He he is more Hans Zimmer than Hans Zimmer is himself. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like. Well, I think they're all like pre, they're all old music arrangers or, or conductors of Hans Zimmer, aren't they? They've worked under him, and then they've well, well, they're all uh, yeah, exactly, mm. kind of orchestrators and ghostwriters and stuff like that. So, for example, on on I I can't I can't remember what film right, but let's say um, Greg Williamson would have done. Um, uh, he he would have ghost written uh, some music in a film that has Hans Zimmer's composed by name on it, mm. and he he would probably not get the credit. Yeah, dependent. my friend Jamie, who's a musician, said that. Uh, he said uh, Hans Zimmer kind of is the brand, and then people I guess will work under him and then write yeah. a lot. That's how he does like four or five scores a year sometimes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And Hans Zimmer is is. He's basically associated with the Pirates of the Caribbean, right? Yeah. But but Klaus Badele, he, he started it, right? Yeah, but yeah, but he didn't write the yeah he didn't write the music like so he didn't write the main team mm. the, the, the the music that everybody like yeah, loves from that film, um, which is not a bad thing. It's just that yeah he ha- he's he's a brand. He has a network of people. He can he gets it done, and yeah. Uh, it's interesting you say that because in Armageddon, which is Trevor Raban's score, uh, who did Con Air and stuff, there's a, a th- what's it called? The Asteroid Chase. That's the name of the track, I think. And the theme to the Asteroid Chase is the Pirates of the Caribbean theme from the first one by Klaus Badele. So I'm not sure how that works. But is it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, s- I'll send you a link to it and uh, you can compare the two. There's also a uh, a track in Black Rain, which is Hans Zimmer, which he recycles in, uh, what is it, Batman Begins as well. So, I mean, I guess they do that, but I've never yeah. seen, I'm, I didn't get the crossover because Trevor Ban is one person, Klaus mm. Badele is another, and then in Pirates of the Caribbean 2, Hans Zimmer took over scoring in name, I guess. I'm not sure if he, how involved he was, but then he did the rest, yeah. rest of the films. It's just, a, it's a strange system now that, that no one person, like you said about the John Williams and the James Horner type people, now yeah, it's they're called, gone. Yeah. It's, almost it's like, called ghostwriting, basically. You know, they, they're going to have a team. It, it dep- deadlines and stuff demand that. Um, you have a staff. They're probably going to have a couple of people uh, writing the music uh, on 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 some films. You know. So how would it work? Many. Would he write the bare bones of a track and go right, make that sound sexy or something, and just hand it over to another composer? Yeah. Okay. Well, no, it, it would go to an orchestrator. Um, look. How does, see. It, so how does what does Batman, he all... using Batman example right? So there's so there's two main composers on Batman right? So there's Hans Zimmer and there's um, James Newton Howard. James Newton Howard, yeah. And so the, I don't like I don't know what the split is. You know, let's pretend it's fifty fifty. Mm. And so they both wrote tracks, and all of the tracks would have been, I imagine, orchestrated by um, by a team of orchestrators. Right. 
uh, who then, you know, make it nice and uh, uh, you'd copy all the parts out and stuff, you know, and give it to, give it to the to the recording uh, to the musicians to record. Sure. Wow. It's it, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure how I feel about that. I know. I guess that's how the business is now and stuff. But uh, I mean. Well, as, well, as you well, move into this world, how do you fit into that? Mm-hmm. Is it going to be hard for you as a singular composer to kind of start creating scores, say, if you're working in video games, the way, uh, I guess, I think uh, Michael Giacchino, who did the Mission Impossible 3 score and a lot of the yeah. Pixar movies, he started in uh, video games and stuff. And I think Brian Tyler, too. How, yeah. how, would you, how do you fit into this world as you're slowly moving into making features? Are you going to be able to, like, make your own scores or would you kind of be absorbed into some greater behemoth of a brand name and then hopefully work under them and then break out into uh, an even yeah, larger I, pool. I, I reckon that's probably the only way it, it could realistically happen. Right. Um, the idea of, to, to, I mean, I, th- I think it's odd, right? What, what I found, right, as somebody who's, who's I would say, forced, right, forced to, to do everything themselves, right, do the orchestration. It's good to know all this stuff, right, so it's definitely useful. Mm. But, um, have, you know, compose the piece, orchestrate the piece, <laughs> and actually produce the mock-up, uh, which is generally actually the, the piece. It's incorrect to call um, what I produce a mock-up because I'm producing the finished yeah. uh, piece, right? A mock-up is something that is... Uh, a facsimile of the soon to be recorded real uh, sure. piece, you know what I mean? Okay. So, um, so what it's okay. So what I found was, right. I found that there's a lot of people kind of doing what I'm doing. And when they find out that there's teams of, uh, oh, well, it doesn't have to be teams, but like one or two orchestrators taking what the composer row fleshing their now for the orchestra and, 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 bureaucracy. and then they go, yeah, the ghost writers and all that stuff, they're all like, you know, whoa, what the hell? You know, those guys aren't, aren't actually that hot because, you know, they're not doing their... But I think, I, you know, I think that's kind of silly, you know, time-wise, schedule-wise, you know, working in the film industry, there's no way you can continue to be doing scores if you're sitting there with a pen and paper and you're the only person doing pretty much everything. Sure. Um, yeah, you need a team. Uh, I'd love to have a team. I would love to be able to compose a piece of music and then hand it to somebody who isn't is uh, <laughs> really good, really good at orchestrating and and knows how to orchestrate that piece for to get the you know to get the right tone and feel for it. Mm. Now I would I would do a sketch. You know I wouldn't say here orchestrate that one line melody for me please. <laughs> you know I I would sketch out kind of what my plan is for for the piece and that's what the composers do. John Williams, for example, he doesn't do the final, final, huge, fleshed-out orchestration, but he has such a detailed sketch that pretty much the, all the orchestrator is doing, in most cases, is just making it ready for mm. recording, because he knows what John Williams wants from his uh, from the from the sketch that's being created, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, strange, and to think Hans Zimmer started off in Buggles. Did you know that video killed the radio star? No, it's two guys and Hans Zimmer. <laughs> he's coming here. He's coming here. At, um, well, what what month is he coming here? He's I, coming here. He was here a couple of years so, ago in a, I think, a couple of September's back, and I missed him then. And Ennio Morricone, I think, is in March in London. Did you know? He's performing. Yes, yeah. he's here in Morricone is here in um, April. Okay. I think. And Hans Zimmer is here in. Hang on. <laughs> Well, I Google him. Is here uh, Dublin, or you mean in uh, London? Yeah, in Dublin, Dublin. Okay, oh, Dublin. cool, awesome. I, I'm in, I'm in Dublin. Are you going, going to go and see him? Here. No, I'm actually not because I know what show he's playing. He's he did um he did a documentary called is it called This Is Hans Zimmer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Yep. So, I think it's the same. Um, kind of style of thing i'm not I'm, i have to say right i'm not a huge i'm not a huge hans zimmer fan right yeah. uh, I, I think he's great what he does and but i don't sit i don't listen to his scores very often um so you know uh, going going to his concert for the sake of it sure no not not really interested and if john williams ever came you know i'd be there in the light yeah i was um, lucky enough to see john williams in 2000 and 12 was it at the hollywood bowl in los angeles and he played 
Yeah, he played uh, a lot of his pieces and he scored some bits to E.T. Uh, the only problem was when he struck up the Star Wars score, everyone in the audience had these bloody lightsabers and it kind of ruined. <laughs> oh, right, <laughs> and they yeah. were screaming through the entire track. But yeah, I got to see... Uh... <laughs> and I'm going to go... You're seeing Raiders of the Lost Ark, aren't you? No. Okay, I'm seeing the Royal Albert Hall Raiders of the Lost Ark, which they're going to score against the film. I've only just double-checked the tickets, though. Obviously, it's not... Uh, John Williams. It's uh, I think it's the something Prague Philharmonic Orchestra. I think, or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's. Well, it wouldn't be Williams. He's too old. He's not going to travel now. He's not going to do that kind of stuff. You know. Yeah. yeah. Um. I think. Well, maybe it's maybe it's not the reason why, but the Star the new Star Wars was uh, recorded in L.A. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure so, it was. Yeah. It's uh, it's too far to come really to uh. To yeah. Score a film. All the- all the previous scores were by the London Symphony Orchestra. I'm just trying to think. Maybe you should write to uh, David Arnold. Is the only British composer I can think of that's still based in Britain uh, vehemently and adamantly? He yeah. Did, did all the Bond scores up until the last two? Uh, sadly, maybe you should like uh, try and reach out to him somehow and see if he, you can work under him or work together, perhaps. <laughs> no, I mean. Always I, swing for the fences, Graham. That's my motto. Go yeah, big or go home. Yeah, I know. It's, it's not completely feasible at the moment. I mean, I'm just, you know, sitting here with one little computer and a little keyboard. I have a full-time job that's not at all related to composing. Mm. That's my point, though. That, I mean, what you've achieved with a little computer and yeah, having I, I having little time, the score you've done for Arthur and Merlin, and yeah. uh, is it Malcor's Envy, the Silmarillion stuff you've done, which uh, I'll link under the this video for listeners uh, on YouTube. Well, I, 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 do, I, obviously I don't know about music, but how you pull all that stuff off, I have no idea. It's, it's fantastic. I'm not just saying that because, you know, my connection to the, the Arthur Merlin film, everyone I've, that's seen it has always talked about the music above all other things uh, than anything. They've like the music. I've got two friends that have bought the soundtrack. Uh, I've got it twice. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, you, you. You have the special, special edition. Yeah, with uh, so, some tracks that really should be in there. Uh, yeah, I, what I, I think what you've achieved there is utterly fantastic, and for you not to like carry on and keep going on to bigger and better things, I'll eat my hat. I'm, I, I'm. Well, you know, what? I, I don't actively look for work because I found I won't be able to keep doing it all. Like you mm. know, I mean, working on the film, I have to say, was well, was fairly tough uh because it was a lot of i was talking to marco about this it was a lot of evening uh late night kind of stuff you know so working full time and another job coming home at six o'clock and then working on a film and you know i would have loved to have been able to and i did take a week off but there was still a lot of back and forth i can't say i got a huge amount done in that week sure. that i took off work to work on the film um because creativity and stuff you know suffers when you're yeah, you know, under pressure trying to start, from, yeah. yeah, you know, after a full time job, you're, you're tired and everything else. Uh, I find that when I wake up in the morning and I have time and start writing music, I really uh, enjoy kind of and, and like what, what I create when I'm in that kind of mode, you know. Uh, work on the film there was there was no chance to do that it was a midnight aisle kind of stuff all the time mm. and, and it worked out uh, very well I mean there was a lot of uh, kind of back and forth talking with Ennis the sound designer about you know what sounds he was putting into the film what, what I would have to stay out of the way of uh, that kind of stuff and that kind of shaped that kind of shaped the music as I went through it which is why I felt that the pieces that I wrote away from the film that made it into the film as they were. Mm. Uh, generally, Jordan, the yeah, you know, Arthur walking on the hill, uh, we're, we're sweeping the camera shot in the background, kind of stuff. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, I think that's the best bit in the film. <laughs> it's just all carried <laughs> by music. It's amazing. Yeah, no, it was good. It was good to be able to write a piece of music that that went in there because when I read the script, I got the feeling that that's. I mean, the screen director or the art direction actually said that you know there's going to be a camera you know sweeping camera shot he's walking up the hill or whatever it be you know so i kind of got the idea that there was going to be some elements where where this music could fit in and so i wrote it and and it were with very minor edits it, it fit on screen as well uh, which was great 
So has it worked? So they've got like let's. Uh, I think James Horner mentioned this as well. Working with Cameron, he, Cameron would recut the film as he was composing, and then completely ruin the piece he tried to fit in with yeah, all the acknowledgements in. Yeah, aliens, yeah. Do How does it work as a composer when you work on a film? Uh, say there's a there's do they have like let's say there's like a twenty second. I guess, piece of footage, you have to acknowledge certain things. How does that work? Do you compose a piece, hand it over, then shorten or lengthen or acknowledge things once you've seen the piece? Or what do they do? How does the back and forth happen between you and anyone you work with, perhaps, on a, on a film like that? Um, well, it, well, with the digital age, you know, it's kind of different now. You're right. So you you got to, what you hope is a locked core, right? Yeah. But not necessarily always. Right. So it didn't, right? I had a film that was very, very close. Most of the scenes were going to stay as they were. Uh, though Marco warned me that there was a couple of changes probably going to happen. And the only thing I was really concerned about, well, not concerned, the only thing I would had, I had to kind of plan for, right, was that the time code might have to shift. Because if you take 20 seconds out of a particular scene, uh, I need to be able to shift the time code back by 20 seconds. And it's not just 20 seconds, it's 20 seconds and five frames. <laughs> you know, so it gets, it gets very, very tricky, especially if you have very, very precise uh, cut points where you're changing the scene in the middle of the music and the music has to sort of change for right on the right on the frame where the scene changes. A mm. uh, couple of them uh, during the film. So when... Yeah, so, so so what I'm doing is I'm writing music. I'm trying to, you know, just get the emotion and all that kind of stuff from the scene. Uh, I <laughs> This is another thing I learned. Um, I'm not mixing... I want to... I'm not mixing the music uh, into the film. Yeah. I'm just writing some music over the film. Sure. And the, and the film I had was a raw footage uh, with bad audio. So the audio was very... You know, the mics were, you know, it was mono mic'd and it was probably only in the left ear. Uh, there was wind and noise and all that other stuff, right? So it wasn't processed uh, dialogue, right? Sure. Sometimes you could barely hear what you were saying. Um, but most of the time, I could, I could, you know, I could make it out. But it wasn't a finished audio track any, by any means. And it didn't have any sound effects. So I wrote a piece of music and I'm obviously not really trying to mix it in. I did drop it. A little bit so you could hear what people were saying if there, if there was dialogue over it and then I sent it off and then you know what can happen is you kind of get the music is sticking out right but that's because I wanted to hear here's what the music will be on that scene and then I kind of got the impression that uh, so you know you watch this and you kind of go oh the music is too obtrusive well yes it's a it's it's raised in volume sure. <laughs> you would mix it down into the scene so yeah, going back to what I was saying about Star Wars and John Williams writing intricate music and it's just low volume under the background and when you hear the route of film you go wow isn't John Williams great Look, listen to that music he writes mm. and then you listen to the scores today where everybody says don't step on the dialogue don't step on the dialogue mm. and it's uh, sustained chords for four minutes you know yeah. with hardly anything happening so, so, so that's what kind of I what I've learned is that if if I if I'm going to show uh, demo some some of the music, I will probably mix it down fairly low, right? Uh, and maybe give the track as a separate, you know, and listen to the music as well separately at a normal volume. How does this? Uh, you've done a lot of audio books and things for book track and uh, some readings and things. Is that an easier job than working on a film or a moving image? Or, or is it, it is it is. is because you, you can get away with sustaining a feeling um, without having to mirror or bring out uh, what's happening on screen sure um, certainly you won't have to worry too much about sync points uh, or anything like that yeah it's definitely easier because you can carry like three paragraphs of a horror story you could carry a suspenseful vibe underneath that but um, does it have a director or a, some kind of creative creative force that's kind of uh, giving you points or guiding you, giving, asking, I want this, I want this? How does it work on an audio book? Or a... not, not in the stuff I've done, no. On the stuff I've done, uh, I've pretty much been responsible for, for just deciding what way the music should go. Sure. So um, 
Because the Jungle Book's have... really fun as well. What? The Jungle Book. I love that one. The uh, the tracks in the oh, Jungle yeah, Book. Yeah, yeah that's so yeah. much fun and like adventure filled. I mean, and... Yeah, I, I was. They're, they're my early things, sorry. So I was doing them when I was still discovering the whole orchestration thing and, you know, I had to do it and I'm still still purchasing uh, libraries that were sounding better than the previous one and, you know, building up a kind of uh, a proper bass. Uh, I haven't listened to them in some time. But, uh, but, but yeah, those tracks, that, um, you know, the idea behind them was, yeah, you know, an adventure, adventure kind of sound and, um, you know, just, you know, just follow, follow the story beats, you know, uh, sadness, play a sad track. Without we're, we're uh, dumbing it down too much, that's kind of all you need to do. Mm. You know, if you know if someone is is telling a sad story in 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 this uh, audio book or wherever it be, um, whether book track is reading, by the way, it's not um, no voiceover. But uh, the Lovecraft stuff that I've done uh, just recently, that's uh, that's full voiceover. Sure. So I I have to mix the music down a little bit underneath his voice uh, but put the voice in the center you know almost a mono kind of sound in the center yeah uh, and then the music can can sit on either side of that uh, on the track and, uh, and it kind of works very well so the voice is really clear the music is, is actually quite clear as well and it, it you know and again it's all the horror stuff the hp lovecraft stuff that i've been doing i was gonna say yeah the edgar Allan poe and the hp lovecraft is there something are you attracted to that kind of like D dark side kind of like horror stuff is it uh is it more... yeah definitely yeah, yeah. definitely um is that because um, it's more mood as opposed to writing some like big action adventure score is it is it uh just creating is it underscoring is it just how, how, how do you explain it is it creating a feeling or is it it's it's de it's underscoring yeah with with the voiceover it's definitely underscoring um because you know you don't you don't want to do too much again like i'm always contradicting myself you don't want to do too much yeah uh, with the music moving around the melody and all that but what i find is like i you know i can't help myself and like and i put melodies and stuff in there. <laughs> but the, the best way to treat it is to treat the voice as a solo instrument right so the voice is doing its thing and that's the solo instrument that gets prominence and uh, what happens with the orchestra is that in between the voice Little, little, little hints and a motif, and little, uh, you know, you know, little trills and whatever else, you know, just kind of happening, uh, a bit, small bit of movement, uh, you know, of a melody or something. Yeah. And then the voice starts the next paragraph, and you can kind of maintain that, you know, and but you, you have to change. What I found with doing the audiobooks was, um, doing doing the H.P. Lovecraft uh, stuff that it's going to be released um, this year. Uh, how do I, how do I keep it sounding different? Yeah, you know, how can, how do I avoid the same tone of music for seventy minutes? That's how long the CD is, uh, for seventy minutes. Um, do you get how's how does writer's block work? for a, like a writer of music, is it the same? You just get like, I have bad days when nothing will come out, and then you'll get ten minutes on a Saturday afternoon. And go oh, and then. It'll flow f through you in a sense. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. I mean, it's, it kind of comes back to that thing when I when I wake up in the morning and work on stuff. It, wow, it's it's all flown and it's it's good and um, it's really that's the thing. This job is it's, it's really easy when it just flows mm. and you seem to be just you know flying through the stuff. You know, you're doing ten minutes of music a day. And it's fully orchestrated and everything. I said, "Wow, that's that's great." And then the next day, you have your head in your hands, going, "I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> <laughs> I can't figure it out." And then you're trying different things and not working. You're not working. And you just keep trying different things until 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 what either it's a film or a voiceover, or whatever it be, just accepts what what you've done. It's like you're offering up this t you know, sacrifice, you know, mm. to to the to the film and saying, "Here you go. Please accept this." And it goes, "No." Nope. And so, all right, let me try again. <laughs> you, you, you know, and that's where it was like working on Arthur Merlin. Marco Ennis, please accept this. Oh, let's tweak this, change that, blah, 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 you know. So are you ever trying to like just escape out of the barn like a racehorse with like these big sweeping uh, scores and he's trying to rein you in a bit? 
does it ever work like that or is it, <laughs> or the, is it... The, I mean it was great working with Marco and Ennis it was brilliant I learned so much and, and I think I think does they he... probably learned as much as Marco especially probably learned a good bit about um, you know the music and you know what what goes into it and how it can change everything but um, what was I going to say yes so because he said um, no crawl, and I was like, crawl, you've got to do crawl. <laughs> exactly, yeah, no crawl, yeah, crazy, uh, fanfare-ish, uh, Rata Khan, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> rescore, basically. Which is, yeah, it is, isn't it? It's like a, well, I think Horner does lots of kind of like self-plagiarism, doesn't he? I think more, yeah, well, more than many he, of them. He had no choice, he had two weeks to finish the film, by the time he finally gave him the green light for the film to actually score mm. he had uh, probably less than two weeks and he said look I've got no choice but to just you know reorchestrate as much as I can uh, to, to hints of ideas that I've already done you know previously that's why I say sad um, he's gone I think it's uh, I was really looking forward to the, the next Avatar score I think the Avatar score is really good uh, but yeah, he uh, died, yeah. listeners, on August. No, is it June? The, yeah, last June, June 2015, in a plane crash. Sadly, so that's one yeah. less of the uh, the corn gold kind of boys left who weren't not the Hans Zimmer crew. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, what was the original <laughs> question? The original well, question I, do you was... ever kind of like when you worked with Marla, Marlon? What am I doing, Marco? Marco. <laughs> Marco Van Bell, the director of Arthur Merlin. Sorry, Marco. Uh, when you were working together, as you were learning, he was learning your side of the fence. Oh, yeah. You were learning his. Was it, how did he kind of like? Uh, how do you keep yes. control of the situation when you go? I want this and the big sweeping this and. Yeah, there was there was there was a few parts where I I was kind of saying like I really want. Just let rip the on this movement, bit. The movement in this piece to stay there. That, you know that kind of stuff, and th and then th and 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 sometimes he says yeah that's grand and we mix it down a little bit and it works it works fine. Those are times where uh, I try to predict, uh, you know, after doing about ten tracks or so, right, or ten ten cues or mm. whatever it be, I tried to predict what he was going to say. I you know I was kind of learning what his what his preferences were and what his preferences you know weren't and, and everything else. So I tried to predict and probably got it wrong most of, the, most of the time so I was like Marco would say that this is too much movement or blah 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 so I'd dumb it down and then it'd be like you know it's pretty sustained and there's not much going on you know, okay <laughs> and then there was a scene where um, Arthur has just left Alwyn uh, he's going he's going he's going off right he's going to find Marilyn and is, the, is that the parting is that the, is that the, that's the parting yeah, right yeah, yeah. so so in the in the parting, what happens is when it cuts to him walking on the you know it gets the big sweeping melody okay, mm -hmm. so what I had originally written was uh, and it's in the film <laughs> what I originally wrote is in the film right but but listen to this so he he's walking away and he's and the shots are sweeping around him and it's the big melody and then it cuts to him close. You, you know, I don't know if you remember this. So it cuts to him close, and he's still he's still walking, but it's a more intimate shot. It's sure. like the, the camera is now just here with him, and he's walking through a couple of flowers or something like that. At that point, I reduced the music to a more subtle, intimate feeling as he was sort of sauntering along, as opposed to the epic sweeping shot that went before, mm. right? And Mar Marco heard that and says, "No, no, don't do that." keep the big sweeping music going, you know, you know, and, you know, and going into the, into the cut of Dennis Afrin. Yeah. And I was like, okay, that's what I had originally. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to have to reorchestrate that and redo it. He probably doesn't even notice himself. And so, so that's where I went back to the original. I had to reorchestrate it, rescore it and uh, basically just put back in what he had originally done, but haven't tried having trying to predict yeah what was going to happen they ended up you know going the opposite way well that happens with acting i think you you start you do a scene in the morning and then they'll go all around the the houses as it were trying to do different things and they'll just use the original thing you shot first first time you're like oh that was a yeah <laughs> just to I rediscover think I think, yeah i think what i learned was right just do what you think is right for the scene mm. and then if the director 
also agrees to think it's if you if you do what you think is right for the scene, you will probably hear it eight times out of ten. Well, it's when you yeah when um, you're trying to second guess what someone else thinks yeah, and you're exactly. not thinking you're for yourself, guessing, you're not yeah. giving your best work, are you? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so and and then there was a scene in the cave where kind of scored it as a you know s- suspense, right? So, so you know he's kind of crawling around the cave with his torch and it's, you know it's suspenseful. Uh, and Marco said to me make it more of a horror kind of vibe, you know, make it, make it creepier. Yeah. Like we know he's going to find Marilyn, but let's make it a bit more of a, he don't really know what he's going to find. Yeah. Kind of thing, you know? So, I mean, stuff like that is, is good and useful. And it shows the difference of uh, the way the music can change the scene. And, and, you know, the way the director kind of has a very clear thought in his head of what he wants. And, yeah, that's great. When you when you get that clear direction, straight away, uh, it makes the job so much easier because then you can deliver exactly what's been asked. Yeah, I just hope you guys get a sequel so you can like continue those themes and make it maybe even bigger and you know just like expand as it were the same way I guess John Williams did with the first Star Wars and then he carried those themes over into Empire and then built on them and added like the Yoda theme and etc. So yeah. yeah, just uh, let's hope. Uh, it, uh, picks up even more in America as well because if that yeah yeah that I mean, that'd be great I think it will I don't know I've got this f- funny feeling well there's no reason why it shouldn't everyone I know that's uh, seen the film just think it's utterly remarkable I think I've said this before I've said this to Marco I think uh, if he keeps getting another chance and another chance he'll be the next Peter Jackson he just needs to kind of get that thing and like the same with you as well everyone that works on that film is destined for great things you just uh, need to get to the next uh step i think but i mean especially you that music literally carried that film and made it an even bigger uh, viewing experience than it than it would have been i think in the hands of a, a lesser composer so you know well done sir you did a good job Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh so yeah what's you do what's the next step for you before we sign off you're doing the uh silmarillion stuff or is it the edgar Allan poe or is it the lovecraft stuff right uh it's the Lovecraft stuff will be out. Uh, I don't have a date for it. But it's it's almost final. It's a, I have the official title. So mm-hmm. it's fun, the H.P. Lovecraft's Fungi from Yogurt and Other Poems. So it's Lovecraft wrote a lot of poems. He wrote 36 sonnets, which are the Fungi from Yogurt. And then he wrote a whole bunch of other poems, mm. uh, which are all, you know, most of them have a horror slant. Uh, he wrote one about uh, Edgar Allan Poe, <laughs> and so so uh, American VO uh, Will Hart has done a reading of all of all of these, and it's seventy minutes long. Wow! Uh, uh, in total, uh, and every single one of them is scored completely uh, or underscored uh, all the way through. How long does it How uh, long does it take to come up with seventy minutes of music? It doesn't sound like an easy feat, and it's a longer uh, it's a long stretch of time, isn't it? Um. It's yeah, it is. I mean, it's a film. Yeah, you know. So I mean, the score for Adder Merlin is about uh, the the full, 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 full score. It's about seventy five minutes. Yeah, I think uh, roughly, and that took, you know, you know, with changes and ideas, and then recuts of the film and, and all that kind of stuff. That you know, that took nearly two months to to finally. You know, get to get to a place where we're all ready to, you know, print, sign off on it. You know, um, the how, how long would a composer like, have? Let's say that it was, uh, let's say Hans Zimmer works on a project or whoever. I mean, what's the window of time in which he or John Williams would have with the, a film they would work on? Uh, Hans Zimmer. Uh, well, you know, it's kind of changed from film to film, but usually they kind of say roughly it could be around three to four weeks. Okay. Um, right, probably more. Does that Sometimes include writing as well? Well, well, you see, this is writing the music, then you're handing it to other people, mm. and, and they're going to orchestrate it, and, and everything else is going to happen, you know, sort of behind the scenes. So while you're still writing music, all the music you wrote previously is being prepared, and, you know, and, you know, you know it's, it's a bit like a, completely like an assembly line but there is an element of that 
it's not just waiting on one person to actually get it done. Sure. It's, you know, a lot of stuff is still moving. And there's probably, no, especially with Hans Zimmer, there's probably a number of people writing writing cues, mm. yeah, especially for more incidental underscore cues. John Williams, John Williams probably takes about three months to uh, finish the score. Um, he, he, you know, he, he's probably done many scores faster than that, but I think, I, I do believe a general time frame for Williams is about three months, maybe two months. Is that a luxury um, bestowed on him because he's like the number one guy or is that a, a standard for many composers really? Um, was that because he's a singular composer, as it were, versus someone like Hans Zimmer uh, you mentioned? So, I th- yeah, I think I think John Williams is in a has always been in that position. Not always, but you know, very quickly got into that position once sure. he started working with Spielberg, where mm. he under less pressure was, in a, in a sense. He, yeah, well, possibly. Yeah, I mean, he probably felt pressure working on the film, trying to get different uh, aspects of it finished, but. It's definitely, I would never uh, say that his scores have an assembly line mentality to them. You know, um, he, uh, I mean, when he was doing Empire, right, so he's working out of the back office on the, on the, on the Empire uh, Strikes Back, uh, you know, a lot in... Uh, Elstree, I think they did the Star Wars films, right? And then they recorded in Abbey Road, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and 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 there's footage of him from a documentary where he's sitting in this room and all there is is like a piano on a table, and he's just you know he's playing a few notes, writing it down, and then Herb Spencer comes in and he's the orchestrator and he hands him the sketch and Herb Spencer goes off and he starts just fleshing out the sketch and mm. you know and that was pretty much it. He probably did that, probably worked on it like that for 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 two months or something. Right. Uh, just just doing that on the music. I'm not really sure how long it took. How long it took. Is it um, is it a lonely job? Um, to a certain point, is it kind of a quite a sedentary, not sedentary, solitary, kind of experience being a composer? It's not lonely, but you do want to be on your own. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, you kind of lock yourself away in your office or wherever it be. You know, if you, if you have or your studio, if you if you have those. Uh, that kind of setup, you know. Yeah. Uh, so you so you can write music like Howard Shore in Lord of the Rings. You know, he he'd go to France and he'd he'd vacation in France for for two months just writing music, mm. uh, with the Lord of the Rings book open on his desk, um, you know that kind of stuff. Uh, going back to the original question, uh, time wise, the Lovecraft stuff, seventy minutes of music, uh, with the voiceover. I did that in. If 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 you. I did it across a period of time because the recordings were coming in yeah. in periods, right? But if you actually counted up the the amount of uh, work hours uh, I put into that, I probably did the entire 70 minutes in five days. Right, wow. That's, because that's it, full it just, time, what, 12 hours a day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, probably yeah 10 hours a day uh, probably no more than 10 hours a day uh, and there was there was almost no rewrites uh, so so when we have a publisher in America uh, Fidogan and Bremer um, who published various uh, Lovecraft related uh, stuff you know CDs and, and uh, sure. uh, books and stuff and they pretty much signed off on everything that, that I sent uh, so it was. I have to say, it was a, it was great. It, it was you know working on Arthur Maryland was was fantastic, but when you're working on a project where everything you deliver is yes, that's oh my god, I didn't even expect that. That's I love that. <laughs> Thank you. You know you know what I mean. You know what I mean? It, it, was, it was a great feeling, and yeah. and and, uh, and 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 it came so naturally. That's why it took. It was so such a short time frame, mm. uh, because I love writing that kind of stuff, uh, that kind of music, and. I felt what I was writing was working almost straight away. And so we have 26 sonnets. Each, every single sonnet is scored differently, has a different kind of tone and feel. Some of them are subtly different. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a, there's a hint of a motif running through it because there's a cosmic horror is the overriding uh, kind of theme of the Lovecraft. Uh, yeah, the ancient you know. evil, the elder gods. Yeah, Cthulhu. exactly. Yeah. 
And so, and so there's little motifs and themes that kind of hint at, you know, if Cthulhu gets mentioned, you'll you'll hear something, you know, related to that. If uh, where, you know, wherever to be. Sure, and then that it's comes melting. back whenever that kind of like. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, it, and it, it can be it can be as simple as three notes, or, or it can be simple as an instrument. Uh, it, um, an, an odd low alto flute played when this was mentioned and you'll hear that again like you know 40 minutes later when when this uh, ins mount or you know the uh, arkham or whatever it is gets mentioned again you know yeah well now i'm looking forward to that uh, uh if anyone's so listening I... and they uh, want to find your work where can they find you graham um i usually direct people to youtube um uh, because that's got most Just of your sketches and work, hasn't it? That'll be linked for anyone listening uh, to basically under in yeah. the show notes on your little on your iPhone. You can find yeah, uh, you. Graham's YouTube page there. You've got a website yeah, it's as well. The first target. What's your website, sir? Oh, it's GrahamPlayer.com. Cool. I am on Twitter, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I still can't work out Twitter. I think if you're already like a gigantic famous star person. It's good, but I think if you're a regular Joe... I don't Joe, get Twitter either. I yeah. don't get Twitter. How does it work? I post stuff on Twitter thinking it will like take off or be seen and no one sees it. I put something on Facebook and you get a, a, a larger response. It's a, it's a strange... So, social media is a mystery to me as well, I have to say. Uh, some people are really... Some people know how to use it to, to we're their like, advantage. We're like the post-computer age, though, aren't we? That's people. the problem. We didn't grow up with it, so it's kind of... Uh, it's yeah. only been in the last... Like, well, cause social media, especially in the last like eight years, maybe. I think Facebook... I, yeah, I, I think it's a combination of uh, your personality, right, and uh, probably mostly your personality, because I find that Doesn't people... Doesn't bode well for me, then. <laughs> <laughs> or me. People, I find people who are very, very outgoing and very have... Um, what's, what's the right way of saying this? Just display a lot of... Douchebaggery. <laughs> no, the opposite of that. Who's <laughs> display a lot of like you know sort of personal empathy towards all sorts of different things, yeah. right? And post about those kind of things, and respond to people who who are posting, uh, you know, whatever whatever they're saying. Mm. They they're, they're the people who who kind of thrive on on social media, and I don't, I you know I I do it, but I'm not I I can't. Uh, it's having a presence I don't, I don't, constantly, don't like isn't to it? Do it. Uh, what What I'm saying is, I don't, I don't like having to try and promote myself. Yeah, I'm not great at it. Yeah, uh, I don't like having to do it, and I feel odd when I say, "Hey, listen to my music track." I've got this yeah, thing. I, I don't yeah. actually like doing that kind of stuff, you know. I don't. I've also found the response I've got is never from people I really know as well. Strangely, it's always been strangers that have found the things that I do. Versus weirdly getting your friends to support you. I don't know. What does that say? Getting that? your friends to support <laughs> you is a, is an odd thing. It's like if you know if I like if I post a music track and somebody shares it or people start commenting on it. Right, my friends may comment and stuff, mm. but it's the, it's the strangers that latch onto it. Yeah, I think I think when people know you, it maybe that mystery is not do. there. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a weird thing, and and then your friends are sharing. Facebook posts from complete strangers. You know, look at the funny cat video, and you know, you know, what I mean, it's it's an interesting. Um, there's probably a thesis in there somewhere. You know, it's an interesting um, sort of phenomenon. Phenom- yeah, can't even say it. Um, no, I agree. Yeah, it is from uh, strangers. I think because people know you, I guess that maybe element of being able to surprise them, even though if you deliver something fantastic like your music, because people know you. Mm. maybe it's doesn't quite have the same effects as, as it coming from a, a strange and interesting place into your life with someone you don't know perhaps i don't know it is it's, it's a strange uh, quality us people have humans and this new like computeristic social media world we now uh yeah. face with coping with yeah but hey what do i know uh yeah i do look forward to the arthur and merlin 2 score that's all i can say before we uh, sign off graham i've got a feeling it's gonna happen and you're going to smash it. <laughs> um, the empi- you'll be your Empire computer. Strikes Back. Well, I'll get Excuse the production me, to buy it. Uh, I was going to say it'd be like your Empire Strikes Back. You can build on the, the themes you established in the first uh, film. And I also yeah, look forward to the uh, your continuing horror scores. I really want to hear yeah, this Lovecraft thing now. 
Yeah, I can't wait for I can't wait for that stuff to be released. But um, the continuing teams, I'll probably get a mandate from from up above to say I don't want to use anything from the first film. All new. <laughs> I, well, I don't know. I think the nature of any kind of sequel, you kind of need to uh, not do the same thing over and over again, but you need to acknowledge what happened in the first one because that's kind yeah. of what attached people to the thing in the first place. Then you yeah. give them the same mm -hmm. thing in a sense, weirdly, but with a twist or an enhancement perhaps. But no, I yeah. think the score to that film, it, like, I've, I've played it at home and my mum's heard it or a friend's heard it. And they go, what's this? What's, what's this from? And they go, oh, it's from this film, Arthur Merlin. And they go, oh, okay. And that, that, you know, draws... But it's one of the things that everyone says about that film, if they've seen it, is the score. One of the first things. I'm not just saying that because you're on uh, the phone. I mean, I bought the score twice. I loved it that much, for crying out loud. It's, uh, it really is. It's like it's like the, the third, fourth character in the film. It's like one of the leading, you know, characters, as it were. It really is. It's fantastic. Your work's brilliant. Just need to keep going, dude. Yeah, well, thank you. Video well, games is the next thing. meant to be a character in the film, so, yeah. Well, in a, in, a, in a world where very little of it is, I'm glad you're out there flying the flag because, uh, you know, <laughs> there's not many left out there. For now, hopefully you can usher in a new era. But, uh, Graham Plowman, you beautiful man, thank you so much for coming on the show. No worries, thank you. Uh, thank you all for listening, everyone. If you want to find uh, Graham's music, I will link you to the show notes below the show, uh, and I'll direct you to Graham's website also. Uh, when Graham does release the uh, Lovecraft stuff, uh, send me a link, Graham, and I'll uh, I'll post it on this episode page so people can obviously find that if they're finding discovering this show later oh, yeah. on. No, absolutely. Be, later on be, down the line, it'll be straight up on the social media. Hey, look at this thing I did. All right. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll I'll continue to slavishly promote you as I have because I love you. <laughs> Thanks. My number one fan. You, I am, and uh, there'll be the many to follow. Believe me, I, keep, I tell everyone about your uh, your scores. So you know you've got lots of fans. It's growing. I'm telling you. Uh, but you. yeah, I thank so. you, man. And, All right, uh, cheers. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll do this again you. soon. I hope we could do it for Arthur and Merlin too, or uh, we'll do come back for the, uh, the Lovecraft thing. We'll do it. We'll quick quickie on Lovecraft. But yeah, Graham, thank you so much, man. Yeah, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. All right, my brother. Right. See you later, cheers. sir. Over Good and luck. out. <laughs> thank right, you. Bye. -bye. bye. Thank you.